You are listening to The Soapbox here on 90.9, 104.1 WMPG, Southern Maine's community radio station from the University of Southern Maine. My name is Eric Poulin, and uh, thanks for joining us. My, my guest this evening, uh, I'm pleased to announce, is Audra Snyder, and uh, she is the great-granddaughter of Huey Long, who was a popular progressive governor of Louisiana during the Depression and, uh, and then became state senator in the U.S. Congress. And uh, Audra administers the website, HueyLong.com. Her grandfather is Huey's son, the late Russell Long, who served as a U.S. senator from Louisiana for 38 years, from 1948 to 1987. Audra worked on Capitol Hill for uh, three Democratic senators during her early career. She currently lives in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C. with her husband and children. Welcome to the Soapbox, Audra. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you. So I thought we could begin with uh, Huey Long's experience in his hometown of, of Wynn Parish. He has spoken quite warmly about um, the, the uh, tightly knit community that, that he was a part of in Wynn Parish. And uh, I wonder if you could give us some idea of perhaps some of the values that he drew upon from his experience growing up in Wynn Parish. Well, Wynn Parish is in the north central part of Louisiana, and when Huey was born in 1893, it was extremely poor and quite isolated. Uh, it was uh, well known for um, being a center of populism. The people of Wynn Parish were very independent minded, and uh, they were. Um, attracted to the populist messages of William Jennings Bryan and, and other leaders who uh, talked about the importance of championing the needs of the common man above those of the privileged few. And so politically, uh, Huey certainly grew up listening to the old timers uh, talk about this political philosophy. Um, he was the seventh of nine children. Uh, born to uh, a farming family, uh, Hugh and Caledonia Tyson Long. Um, the Longs were pretty well off by Louisiana standards um, because they had enough to feed their family and they were able to educate their children by teaching them to read and, and pooling with the neighbors to hire a teacher to uh, help the children um, of the town of Winfield uh, learn because there was no public education system at the time. And so they valued education tremendously and were unusual in that they were able to educate all of their children. Um, and faith was also an extremely important part of their education. Uh, Caledonia, Huey's mother, was widely regarded as a pillar of the church. Her children described her as a rocked-ribbed Baptist, and uh, studying the Bible daily, going to church twice a week and revival meetings, um, and learning to read and learning their lessons by reading the Bible was central to Huey Long's education. And he was uh, gifted with a photographic memory that he inherited from his mother. And so he certainly at an early age was given advantages that other poor children in Louisiana did not have because his family had enough uh, to give him a good start um, with the ability to, to read, access to books, and an independent uh, political philosophy that would um, encourage him to challenge uh, authority and challenge prevailing uh, political theory of the day. So Huey Long went, went on to become governor of Louisiana, and at the time of his ascendancy, uh, the politics of Louisiana were of a of a particular character, let's say, right? Uh, coming out of the Reconstruction, um, this was not it wasn't particularly uncommon for states in the South to sort of be in the control of of a tight sort of oligarchy of planters and merchants and professionals, um, sort of a government of gentlemen. Uh, but Louisiana sort of took that 
to greater heights, did it not? Um, to what extent was there a genuine democratic process in the political environment in Louisiana when, when Huey Long came to power? Well, Louisiana was more of a plutocracy than a democracy um, in the early 20s uh, when Huey Long was pursuing his political career. He uh, made his name as a reformer by running for office when he was 25 years old to uh, win a seat on the Louisiana Railroad Commission. And at that time, he made a name for himself trying to uh, cut utility rates and um, uh, railroad monopolies and so on and so forth. And uh, he was so successful in that position that he uh, ran for office at age 30 um, for governor in 1924, and he lost narrowly in a three-way race and uh, spent the next four years uh, traveling the state to uh, uh, champion um, the, the needs of people and, and establish himself as a champion of the people. Um, Louisiana, back in 1928, um, it's hard to imagine today, quite frankly. Um, it was run more uh, like an aristocracy than a democracy. Um, there were uh, a ruling class uh, that was made up primarily of the Democratic regular machine and New Orleans political machine that ran the state. They were called the old regulars um, in consortium with uh, the big businesses that profited by the state, uh, namely the oil business um, and Standard Oil was the state's largest employer. And uh, the uh, the planter class, uh, the gentleman that you referred to, who um, enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship of running the state and uh, creating a system of government that was self-dealing and self-serving, um, that really locked the common people of Louisiana out of uh, government. Louisiana had 60%. Uh, rural poor at that time, and these people had no access to a voting booth because of the poll tax. People were required to mm -hmm. pay a poll tax every year um, for the privilege of voting, and what that meant was that at Christmas time, when you went to the parish courthouse to uh, pay your property taxes, you would pay a dollar poll tax. And after two consecutive years of paying this poll tax, on Election Day, you would go to the voting booth and present your two receipts, uh, which is $2 at that time. In today's dollars, that would be about $24 to cast your ballot. And I don't know too many people these days who would pay $24 and two trips to the county courthouse for the privilege mm. of casting a vote. So clearly this was a very oppressive system that was intended to lock people out of power and keep them isolated, keep them uneducated, um, and, uh, and simply enjoy the status quo um, at the very highest um, levels in New Orleans and, and some of the other city centers. Uh, there was a huge difference between life in New Orleans and life one parish over. Um, it was the difference between um, living in a modern society. New Orleans was the second largest banking center at that time and had a huge port and was really going strong. And one parish over, the people would be living in abject poverty and third world conditions. Mm -hmm. And so Huey had a great love for these people who he believed were being oppressed and abused, locked out of power, kept in ignorance. There was no public education system to speak of. There were barely any roads. Louisiana uh, is 52,000 square miles, and 16% uh, of that is covered with water. Mm. And yet, in Louisiana in 1928, there were only 300 miles of paved roads and only 60 miles of those were maintained by the state. Most of those good roads were in New Orleans and in the other cities. 
And so everyone else had to rely on dirt trails that uh, linked the various parts of the state, and it was very difficult to cross all of that water because there were only three major bridges in the whole state. And so there was always a scheme to um, have to pay somebody to get somewhere, to cross a ferry took money and to have to take your crops to market was very difficult because when the heavy rains came, as they always do in Louisiana, those roads would turn to thick mud and uh, people couldn't travel on the roads until the roads dried out. Hmm. And so what that meant is that the people were uh, kept away from the voting booths, from hospitals, from schools, from uh, the market to take their crops. Um, It was just a very depressing, isolating system. And Huey looked around at the deprivation of his neighbors and friends in these rural communities and just said, we can do better than this. You have a right to more than what you are receiving. And if you elect me governor of the state, I'm going to make sure that your government delivers you the services that you deserve. So I think, you know, one of the reasons I, th- I wanted to do this show and have you on um, and discuss Huey Long and his legacy is because I feel that there are uh, p- pretty clear echoes on a national scale to sort of what you just described. I mean, we have a Republican Party in this country that is pretty antagonistic to uh, the right to vote. And they have um, made efforts to sort of curtail that in different ways, perhaps not quite as overtly as a poll tax. Um, But as a result of the elections at the time in Louisiana, whoever, because of the the tight control of this sort of plutocratic uh, leadership in the state, whoever won invariably continued to serve the ruling sort of plutocracy and, and continued to ignore the poor masses um, and served business interests such as the the big one, Standard Oil Company in Louisiana. And uh, as you point out, Huey Long um, saw this as a problem. He was coming from a, a different area of the state and felt that uh, he he seemed to want to bring more democratic um, light to the political process. So uh, he won against the interests of um, the big business in the state, what were some of the things that he was able to do to sort of live up to that promise of representing the people? Because other other sort of populist leaders had come and gone, and once in office, they didn't really actually follow through. What did Huey do to follow through on his promises? Well, Louisiana experienced a sea change when Huey Long was swept into power in 1928. It's amazing um, that he was able to get elected, considering how difficult it was to galvanize uh, the voters. And and he really motivated people to get to the polls and uh, transcend that usual Protestant-Catholic divide that uh, could be a barrier to candidates in Louisiana. They were all rallied around his promise of uh, economic freedom and political enfranchisement, and he promised them roads and bridges and hospitals and schools and lower taxes and a fairer shake and a seat at their government. And he delivered on those promises very quickly. Um, In the four years that he was governor, um, Louisiana went from having 300 miles of roads to 9,700 miles of paved roads which is astounding. Louisiana, by 1936, was employing 10% of the nation's road workers. There were 22,000 men in Louisiana alone building roads and connecting parts of the state. And having those roads made the biggest difference to the quality of life of the rural people of Louisiana. He also built 111 toll-free bridges so they wouldn't have to pay to cross the water anymore. And those are steel structures that are still standing today. And being able to cross all of those uh, Waterways was an immense advantage to people trying to get their crops to market and trying to get to the big cities and trying to get to the hospitals. 
a huge um, benefit to the people was his passage of the free textbook law and establishing free public schools in every community and free busing for the rural children to their community schools. Back in Louisiana, prior to this, children had to purchase their own textbooks to attend class. And textbooks ran from, you know, two or three dollars a piece. And back in that time, two or three dollars to the average sawmill worker would represent two or three days' wages. And so a lot of families simply could not afford to send their children to school because they didn't have the textbooks. And if children went to school without their books, they were sent home. It's just unbelievable. So he really, uh, he really made good on on these promises of of increasing access to education, increasing access to affordable health care, and uh, upgrading the infrastructure of Louisiana. Now, this must have rankled um, the people who had previously been making money off of these these now public goods. What was the backlash? The backlash was immense, um, especially when Huey Long was trying to um, expand uh, health care programs by building charity b- hospitals throughout the state and have health clinics for free immunizations and uh, expanding LSU and uh, all of these uh, programs to uh, provide for the people were expensive, and Louisiana couldn't ordinarily afford these types of programs because it had this uh, oppressive uh, tax system where it uh, most of the revenue was generated from property taxes, and that burden fell disproportionately on people of average means and on the poor because they were taxed on every form of property that they owned. He used to say, every pig every chicken, uh, every cow you were taxed on. And so to finance the kind of uh, programs that Huey was putting forth meant a total sea change in the tax system. Mm -hmm. And he uh, lowered property taxes among the masses immensely, slashing them so that most poor people didn't pay property taxes anymore. He established a very popular homestead exemption, which meant that anyone with a a homestead value of less than $2,000 didn't have to pay property taxes. Hmm. And so the burden of paying for the services went from the poorest of the citizens to industry. And Huey uh, had uh, a new tax system on um, severance tax, the the severance of natural resources Mm -hmm. uh, from the state, particularly oil and natural gas. He was outraged that the previous severance tax of two cents a barrel was um, written by the Standard Oil Company legal department in a gentleman's agreement that they had made with former Governor John Parker. And so the agreement was written by Standard Oil and, st- and rubber stamped by the legislature, and uh, Standard Oil was getting a really great deal out of extracting these immensely um, uh, fruitful resources out of Louisiana, and the people of Louisiana received a pittance in return. And so when Huey Long was proposing shifting the burden of taxation from the poorest of the poor to the industries who were profiting off of the natural resources of the state. There was a firestorm of opposition from uh, the legislators who were still firmly uh, aligned with business and and with Standard Oil. And uh, a year after Huey was elected, he was impeached, and they tried to remove him from office. Um, and he was able to withstand the impeachment. Uh, he was not removed from office, but that experience really changed him and showed him the degree to which he would have to wrestle power away from these entrenched interests and consolidate power within the governorship in order to fulfill the mandate for the people that he had been elected to serve. Yeah, so that that seemed like such an important 
turning point in his political career, that impeachment. Um, and as you say, he came out of it with a different approach to governing, it seems like. And uh, he came out of it with an approach that I think uh, in part has opened him up to uh, the, the critiques of him that have come down of, of uh, sort of a dictatorship approach to, to governing the state. Um, because as you say, he did sort of work to consolidate power um, in his administration. Um, of course, that overlooks the fact that there was plenty of corruption and graft in the existing political structure of Louisiana. And I wonder if it's just sort of sour grapes to a certain extent because he was able to operate within the system more effectively than anyone had previously done. What do you think of that idea, and what do you think of this critique of Huey Long as a dictator? Well, I think that you are correct, and many political observers have noted that Huey Long inherited a corrupt, graft-ridden political system that ran Louisiana. And I believe that the only way he saw to transform the system was to give people the vote and to have that poll tax repealed, and that was extremely difficult, and it took him years to do that, and he ultimately succeeded in 1935, the year he was assassinated. Mm. He also thought that education was so important, and if we had to educate these people, you know, Louisiana had um, the highest illiteracy rate in the country. A quarter of its adults could not read. And because they had no schools, they then could not teach their children to read. So we had an exponential problem of people being chained to poverty. Mm -hmm. So in the long term, Huey's um, program was to educate people and to give them a free ballot box and uh, increase the electorate that way. But in the short term, he couldn't get to that point. Um, he had to use the system that he inherited. And so, ironically, he just turned the tables on the people who had uh, created this system and mastered it in a way that uh, stymied his opponents at every turn. Louisiana was run by the political patronage system, so the governor uh, traditionally had immense power, um, and he could hire and fire state employees and appoint people to various boards, and, um, and this was all designed by the ruling plutocracy. And so when Huey Long came into power, he kicked the old guard out, mm -hmm. installed his own supporters at every level of government, and then continued to turn up the heat on the anti-Longs, as they were called, um, and just beat them at every turn. And it was just infuriating <laughs> to these people who had been thrown out of power. Uh, so they labeled him a dictator. And, of course, they had uh, good friends in the press. Um, these old families owned the newspapers in the state. And so the newspapers routinely criticized Chewy Long, had banner headlines about dictator long this, dictator long that, and, um, you know, plastered negative publicity about Huey Long all over the Louisiana papers. But it didn't work because the people were immediately getting so many services out of their new state government and seeing that their governor was fulfilling every one of his campaign pledges that the newspapers became commonly known as the Lion Newspapers. And it was one word, Lion Newspapers. And so people didn't give credence to the Louisiana newspapers in Louisiana. Um, but that written word sticks, mm -hmm. and those old nicknames stick. And when Huey Long went to higher elective office in the United States Senate and started champion this same philosophy of sharing the wealth and uh, 
relieving the underclass of the burden of taxation and so on and so forth, those old labels from the anti-longs in Louisiana were simply picked up by the national media and have been repeated ad nauseum ever since. Mm. You know, I wonder if there isn't a certain extent of the pot calling the kettle black with that uh, that accusation, at least among his contemporaries in Louisiana politics, because um, it seems evident looking back that they were bent out of shape that, that, as you said, he was sort of wielding these mechanisms of power more effectively and shrewdly than they had previously done so. And uh, quite importantly, without the deference to the existing political economic elites that they felt they were owed as part of this sort of unwritten code of, of Southern politics. That's true. Uh, historically, um, People were elected by accepting large campaign contributions from the industries of the state and mm-hmm. others who wished to do business with the state, uh, those who wished to be awarded contracts and so on and so forth, and it was just a very clear tit-for-tat. Mm-hmm. Um, and bribery was rampant in Louisiana at that time, and Huey Long refused to take money from these interests. He refused to take the usual bribes from industry to do their bidding in the legislature, and he refused to align himself with the usual power bases. Uh, And for that reason, um, he was pretty strapped for cash. And so when it came to doing business in the legislature the way it always had been done, he didn't have money to give to people, but he did have good jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, The governor controlled the jobs, and these legislators... Um, were unsalaried legislators. They worked per diem on a daily rate. And so good jobs meant a lot. And so uh, Huey was criticized for handing out jobs and favors to his supporters, but it was a practice that had been uh, in place for in Louisiana for generations, and he wasn't doing anything that his predecessors had not done. Um, he simply did not enjoy the usual support of the business and the press that his predecessors had. Mm-hmm. And one thing that often gets overlooked, I think, when, when this charge of uh, dictatorship or totalitarianism is levied against Huey Long, is that uh, the people continued to vote for him and his policies and, and his, his uh, political tickets uh, when they were on the ballot. Um, and so he continually relied on the support of the people rather than the existing sort of uh, business and, and political elites. That's right. He was universally loved by the vast majority of citizens who were so grateful to have a friend in government. Before that, people didn't even know that they had a governor. Mm. They were so isolated and so used and so downtrodden. And so it was thrilling. It was really an electric time in Louisiana when roads were being built and hospitals were being built and young people were going to school. And uh, LSU was going strong. Huey tripled the size of LSU and made work scholarships available. And, and people were excited about higher education. And it just, it just seemed like a really thrilling time uh, to be in that state. And, and people were seeing the results of their votes. And they were just enormously grateful. And so this charge of dictatorship did not stick in Louisiana among those who knew the score because they knew that dictators don't try to empower people. Mm -hmm. And that was Huey Long's entire agenda. It was all about freedom. It was about opportunity. It was about empowerment. It was about the ability to vote. And like I said, by 1935, when he finally was able to get that poll tax revealed, uh, repealed, a quarter of a million people immediately registered to vote. And the electorate nearly doubled by the next election. And the election after that, it doubled again. And expanding the electorate is not something that a dictator does. Thank you.